sun rises over the city of Corinth on a windy morning of the year 704 BC. Merchant ship carrying amphorae filled with fine wine from the island of Samos moors in the city's busy harbor. Before its crew begin to unload their precious cargo, a lone passenger disembarks hastily. It is the Corinthian shipbuilder Aminoclis, who is returning home from a short trip to Samos. He brought back with him something much more valuable than Samian wine, an order for a total of four warships. Construction in the small dockyard of Aminoclis started immediately. First, he would cut the four keels from long logs of oak that was considered strong and durable wood. Then his craftsmen started cutting the ribs from local pine wood that was lighter to reduce the ship's overall weight. After that, they would proceed to assemble the ribs on the keels and build around them the hull from Macedonian fear that was quite expensive but offered good waterproofing. Bypassers would stop and observe the warships that were taking form next to the waterline. They didn't look like any of the common designs for war or merchant ships at the time. They were longer, they were narrower, and they were much more complicated. What kind of ships was Aminocles building anyway? before, Periandros, the tyrant of Samos, had invited the famous shipbuilder of Corinth to his island for a hearing. They met one morning inside the temple of Hera, the patron goddess of Samos. Without wasting too much time on formalities, the man in power in Samos laid out his problem to Aminoclis. Samos had gained significant wealth during the reign of Periandros by means of trade. Through its port, the island facilitated trade between east and west, north and south. Pirates, however, were getting bolder and bolder. Operating from their bases on the Carrion coast, they preyed on merchant routes all along the eastern Aegean. These pirates used small and fast ships to attack the heavily loaded merchants. Then they would flee the scene with their spoils before the Samian warships could intervene. The navy of Samos comprised mainly of a type of ship named Pendicontorus. It had 50 oarsmen and was capable of carrying provisions and warriors. The Pendicontor was an ancient design. It had carried Agamemnon, Achilles, and the other Homeric heroes to Troy for the sake of Helen. It had taken the Mycenaean traders to the far reaches of the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. It was a tried and seaworthy ship, but it was also slow. The Samian navy also had some byrings. These ships had twice the oarsmen of the Pendicontor. They sat on two banks, 50 on the bottom and 50 on the top. Some byrames also had a ram on their prow. 
They rarely used it though as they lacked the speed and agility required for ramming. They were faster than the Pentaconders, however, they were still incapable of providing protection to the merchant ships against pirate attacks. Ferreandros was enraged with the economic damage caused by the pirates. His admirals were incapable of solving the problem. They needed a warship even faster than the Byrene. And so, the tyrant asked Aminocles if he could provide a solution to his problem. Yes, answered the Corinthian, and left to board the next ship headed for Corinth. And so the genius of Aminoclis gave birth to the first Greek warships with three banks of rowers. The triremes, as they became known, would soon rule the waves and travel to every corner of the Greek world. During the next 200 years, their design evolved and they were improved to become faster and more lethal. Until, in the early 5th century BC, Greek shipbuilding craftsmanship reached unprecedented heights. Warships that were being built in Athens, thanks to the vision and tireless efforts of Themistocles, were the most advanced triremes Greece had to offer. With a top speed of up to 10 knots, they could outrun any enemy vessel, regardless of the wind's direction. At the same time, their maneuverability was remarkable. They could perform a 360 degree turn, with a turn radius of just two ships' lengths. And so, they could deliver lethal strikes to the enemy vessels with the 200 kilogram bronze rams that were attached to their prows. To what exactly could this outstanding performance be attributed? Mainly to the innovations of Athenians in two areas, shipbuilding and crew training. Athenian triremes with a total length of 37 meters and a width of 6 weighed only 50 tons. This lightweight was achieved with the use of pine wood rather than the heavier types of wood preferred by other Greeks. To work with this lighter material and to reduce the number of ribs, Athenian shipbuilders developed new techniques for the joining, the caulking and the water sealing of the hulls. The keel was designed in such a way that the shock of ramming into an enemy vessel would not be absorbed by the prow, but distributed evenly down the ship's length. Another important improvement was the removable masts that would be dismantled before battle and stored safely below deck. This moved the ship's center of gravity lower, improved buoyancy, and reduced wind drag and oscillation of the hull. With their masts below deck, Athenian triremes were essentially floating projectiles. Finally, Athenian triremes had no deck over the oarsmen and were called aphrakte, meaning without armor. This left the oarsmen exposed to the elements and enemy missiles, but it also reduced the ship's weight. ship's total complement was 200. That number included the oarsmen, the captain, the sailors, and the marine detachment that would fight from atop its deck. Greek triremes traditionally hosted up to 40 marines on board. Athenians, however, made a decisive cutback. They afforded their warships with only 10 hoplites and 4 archers. The remaining crew were all sailors, and so Athenian triremes would be driven by a total of 175 oarsmen, who were faster than those of the other Greeks. The oarsmen sitting on the top benches were called thranite and held the most honorary position. 
right below were the Zijite, and on the lowest bank were the Thalamite. All of them would coordinate their rowing with the help of pipers who provided the rhythm necessary for 175 oars of 4 meters length each to work as a single unit. No one on board would carry any unnecessary weight besides some dry nuts and one day's water ration. During the night, the crews would beach their ships on a nearby coast and proceed to forage inland for food, water and firewood. In the Aegean Sea, after all, there is not a single spot where a sailor has no visual contact with land. The ship's 14 warriors were responsible only for its defense, as for offense, Athenians relied almost solely on ramming. For this purpose, Athenian crews were drilled constantly so as to be able to outflank the enemy, take the favorable position, and pierce their opponent's hulls with their own rams. Soon the Athenian navy would be able to perform complicated maneuvers and its squadrons would be able to conduct coordinated military operations. One such maneuver was the Viekpus, where Athenian triremes would attack in line ahead formation on one point of the enemy line, break through, and then turn to strike the rest of the enemy vessel's vulnerable sterns. Another offensive maneuver was the Peripus, where some triremes would attack in line abreast formation to lock in with the enemy while some others would outflank the enemy line and attack its vulnerable sides. This hammer and anvil tactic would be used by the Athenians with great effectiveness in the upcoming Battle of Salamis. Finally, Athenian squadrons could also perform defensive maneuvers, such as the so-called kiklos, or circle. They were able to place their ships in a circular formation with their rams and fighting decks facing outside, not leaving any vulnerable points for an outnumbering enemy to exploit. To hold their ships in such a tight formation, without anchorage and with the winds in the Aegean blowing almost constantly, required seamanship that only the Athenian navy would eventually develop. These wonderful warships that were being constructed in the dockyards of Piraeus were about to change the nature of naval warfare in the coming centuries. The Athenian trireme, but also the valor of its sailors, was going to play a significant part in the course of history. And they were about to face their first important test in the Straits of Salamis.